We want other people to be saved, right? And that's what it's about. It's about people finding uh, the love of Christ and, and, and as him as their Lord and Savior. Well, we're in a very practical series this week. I've, I've never done a series like this before. Uh, last week and this week, uh, we started it last week. We're talking about Elijah. And last week, we talked about his situation that caused him to have to live on adrenaline for a long period of time, and then his crash and burn. And we were in 1 Kings chapter 18 and the first part of chapter 19 of 1 Kings. And we want to wrap it up today. And the title of today's message is Crash and Burn Recovery. Crash and Burn Recovery. We're going to be in 1 Kings 19, some things that will be a great help uh, to us. Uh, so because for most people, from now until the end of the year, the pace of life will increase dramatically. I mean, you know what I'm talking about right? It just is. We're in a season of that. Some have already been going hard for, for a, a while now and can't really slow down long enough to get enough rest uh, and, and then have to pick it up and really go strong again. And we find ourselves living on adrenaline, right? And though there are many positive effects to living on adrenaline and God gives us that ability at time to, to rise to the occasion, uh, but we can't live there. Right? We talked about that last week, that in times of stress, in times of anxiety, and in times of extreme fatigue, additional adrenaline is released into the body, temporarily enhancing a, uh, uh, an individual's ability to cope. Our adrenaline kicks in. And in order to, it does that in order to keep us going during, during like natural seasons like December where we get really, really busy, but it can be any time during the year. It can be times where life is just really busy or uh, there are times of grieving or uh, long periods of extreme workloads or the demands of life and family and those dynamics and there's different situations and there's nothing wrong with living on adrenaline rushes uh, and having to live there for a while, but there is going to inevitably be uh, a crash that follows, right? Following an increased presence of adrenaline, the human body will begin to try to equalize towards normal balance, during which time a person may experience that adrenaline rush crash. It's then we experience the negative effects of adrenaline, such as a detachment from people and feelings of despondency or maybe even depression, extreme fatigue, paralyzed decision-making, those type of things. Well, it'll help you to know that even in Bible times, people had adrenaline rushes and crashes. It's not something new. That's something new to our uh, age of fast-paced living and technology. And we've been looking at a man by the name of Elijah, the prophet Elijah. So if you weren't here last week, you're just going to have to go back and listen to it uh, and to hear the situations that he was in, that he faced, that caused him to have to live on adrenaline and, uh, for a period of time, and then his crash and burn. But it's found in 1 Kings chapter 18, uh, verse 19, a little bit of recap. Uh, here's Elijah's crash and burn uh, in verse 3, he became overwhelmed by life. He became overwhelmed by life. In verse 3, Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. This is after that, that uh, showdown on Mount Carmel, right, where God sends fire. I mean, this is after that. This is his crash and burn. Uh, second, he isolated himself. I mean, he became detached. Verse 4, he went away a day's journey into the desert, and he went and sat down under a tree. I mean, that, the one thing that he needs, people that can encourage him, you know, he doesn't want to be around anybody. He doesn't want to see anybody. He doesn't want to talk to anybody. Number three, he became despondent. He sat down under a tree and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord. Take my life. I'm no better than my father's. Remember, we talked about that. Number four, he became extremely fatigued, verse five and six. Number five, he was unaware of the miraculous work of God being done at that moment in his life. I mean, an angel is there. And an angel does this twice, two times in a row, uh, cooks for him and provides a meal for him. And after this, he's going to start complaining with things like, God, where did you go and where did I take a wrong turn? This is after Mount Carmel. I mean, he's crashing hard. Right? We, we even sang about it today, right? Even when I don't see you, you're working. Even when I don't feel you, you're working. God, you're always working, right? We sang that. Elijah felt that. Elijah felt, God, where are you? Number six, he was mad at God and disappointed with God. Verse 10, Elijah replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. For the people of Israel have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left. And now they are trying to kill me too. So again, uh, apologies for having to leave it there last week. But today we're going to look at some solutions and how God helps Elijah and some things that we can draw from that will help us when we're on that crash and burn. So uh, for those of you who are here today and, and maybe you're right where Elijah was at, 
Maybe you're right there today and you're experiencing that crash and burn. Or maybe you're here today and you're living on that adrenaline and right now and you know you're headed for a crash and burn. So, so know this. In either of those cases, know this. God brought you here today because God loves you and he's going to strengthen you and God wants you to know that he's there for you. He's not abandoned you. You're just on a crash. Okay? There's nothing wrong with you spiritually. You're just crashing physically, emotionally. Okay? So he's not abandoned you. He loves you. You're just on a crash. Okay? Now, I hope that encourages you because I needed to hear that about 10 years ago. That would have really helped me and, and some struggling there. But it's a hard place to be, and at the same time, it's easy for us when our physical bodies and our emotions are crashing to take that into our spiritual life and to interpret that as though our walk with God is crashing and burning, but that is not the case. Even though your body is trying to recover and to recoup and chemicals are equalizing, your walk with God is safe and secure. He's going to help you. It's going to be all right. It's going to be okay. God really does love you, and you're going to be strong again. Amen? Amen. So when you feel drained, when you feel flooded, when you feel overwhelmed, God's love for you is great enough to secure you, and it's big enough to hold you steady. So there are some things for us to think about. So crash and burn recovery, 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 11 to 18. Let's read it, and then we're going to pray, and then we're going to talk about eight steps of crash and burn recovery. So uh, 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 11 to 8, uh, 18, starting verse 11. The Lord said... Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord. He's talking to Elijah. For the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. Now Elijah knows God is, Elijah knows God is getting ready to speak to him. When Elijah heard the whisper, he pulled his cloak over his face, and he went out and stood to the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I, I have been very zealous for the Lord Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant. He repeats what he said in verse 10, broken down your altars and put your prophets to death with a sword. I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. The Lord said to him, go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazel to be king over Syria. Also anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, to be king over Israel. And anoint Elisha, Elisha, son of Shaphat from Abel Mahola to succeed you as prophet. Aren't you glad you're not the one up here reading the scripture this morning? <laughs> Can I have a volunteer? Get us through verse 15 and 16. Seven, seven, verse 17, Jehu will put to death any who escaped the sword of Hazael, and Elisha will put to death any who escaped the sword of Jehu. Uh, so it's all covered, Elijah. Verse 18, yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal, and all whose mouths have not kissed him. All who, 7,000 who have not bowed down to Baal or kissed that stupid statue, right? So let's open in a word of prayer, and then we're going to talk about this. Uh, Father, we come to you. We thank you today uh, that you love us, Lord. And, and when we've been living on adrenaline for a while and then we crash and we're feeling those negative side effects, Lord, I, I, I pray that, you know, you haven't abandoned us. You haven't left us. Lord, you're still working. You still love us. You're still holding on to us. And Lord, I pray that you would give, give us wisdom and help us today uh, to be able to implement some things in our life that will help us when we're in those down times, uh, Lord, to be able to recover and Father, I pray that your word, the scriptures, would fall on the good soil of our hearts. And Lord, let it go down deep and take root. And let it grow strong and tall and bear much fruit for your glory to build your kingdom and to bless your people. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody says, amen. Are you ready? All right. So we left off where Elijah has crashed and burned. And now God is talking to him. So we're going to look at some steps of recovery. And then we're going to take communion together. So uh, uh, different times, uh, different Sundays, we take communion different times in the service. Today it fits really well at the end of service, uh, at the end of the message. So we'll look at the steps of recovery, take some communion together. And then at the end of service, we're going to open up these altars, have the prayer team come down. And, um, and if you would like someone to pray for you, uh, we would like you just come down and have someone pray for you. Sound good? Sound good. All right. Eight, eight steps. 
Eight steps, crash and re burn recovery. Eight steps. Here we go. Step number one. And these are all in your notes. If you have our church app, you can download that for free. Go to Sunday service message notes. They're all there. All the scriptures are there. Number one, rest. Rest. That sounds good, doesn't it? That sounds really good, right? You have to have rest. God has set up life to where we are to work six days and rest one day. And if we don't take our Sabbath, eventually life's going to come off at the rims, right? I mean, we're just going to wear out. And we have to have a day where, and, and I'm not talking about a day just where we go play hard, right? Where you're pushing yourself on your day off. It's not a day where you wake up from dawn to dusk and, and you're working on all the home projects and you're getting all the other stuff done that you need to get done. You got to have a day where you rest right? And a part of that rest is the recreation of worship and just enjoying the presence of the Lord. So there's got to be that time. You got to let the machine rest. I mean, what good would it be? Like, imagine your car, right? You have your car and you start your car and, and uh, you warm it up for 10 minutes. You get in your car, you drive to the store where you needed to go and uh, uh, on the way to work and you just left your car running while you go in the store. Then you come out of the store and you get in your car Right? You drive, it's, all, it's nice and warm, nobody stole it, that's good. You go to work, you get out for work, but you leave the car running. You go work for eight hours, right? At nine, because you got an hour lunch break. And so you're there nine hours, you come out, your car's still running. Oh, good, right? It's still here. And, and you get in your car, you go home, you park it in your driveway or in the front of your house, in the street there, wherever you park your car, and you just leave it running, right? You just leave it running. Next day you wake up, the car's running, and you decide to drive it. Oh, I'm almost out of gas. You go get gas. You don't even turn it off to get gas. You just keep putting gas in it. And you just keep doing that, and, and you just live like that. You just never turn your car off. Like, what would happen to that car? right? And that's not good for the car. At some point, the machine has to rest, okay? some point, the machine has to rest. So for most people, that would be on Sunday, uh, but there are those who have to work on Sunday, so when your day comes off, you have to have that rest of recreation. And again, a few weeks ago, we did a message on the Sabbath uh, entitled The Lord of the Sabbath, and so uh, we're not going to take too much time on this right now. You can go back, listen to that. And uh, there's a lot of things about the Sabbath in that previous message entitled The Lord of the Sabbath. And, and probably next year we're going to do a, a message again on the Sabbath. Uh, we might go through the Ten Commandments and we'll, we'll explore it a lot more there. Uh, but you can go back a few weeks ago and, and hear more about the Sabbath. But now when we don't take that on a regular basis, ultimately life begins to work against us. And we begin to wear down and we begin to lack that reservoir that we need to be able to negotiate life. And beyond that, when, when we're talking about, you know, the living on adrenaline crash uh, recovery, once you come down off of that, it's going to take time to readjust. It's going to take time. There's no way to speed that up. You can't speed it up. There's no shortcuts. It just takes time. So we have to, in our life, create the margin for that to happen. Now, it's wonderful if you have vacation time and you can take two, three weeks off and you can rest. Hey, praise God for that. But that's not always possible. So for those uh, who that's not possible for, maybe what it means is you cut back on a lot of things in your schedule. You do your job, you go to work, and then you don't cram your evenings full of other things, right? You get off work and you rest. And you just have to understand it's going to take a little time. And you have to give yourself time. I'm going to say, hey, you know, I'm going to give myself this amount of time and I'm going to rest. And don't get stressed out. And I would encourage you, don't make life, uh, major life decisions when you're down. Okay? That that's, never turns out good. So take some time to rest. And when we read, when we read the Gospel of Matthew, we read what was maybe the second hardest day in the life of Jesus. The second hardest day in the life of Jesus. In Matthew chapter 14, Jesus gets the news his cousin John the Baptist has been killed. He says to his disciples, hey, let's get away for a little bit. He, he, he goes to get away. They get in a boat. The crowd sees him. They beeline it to where he's going. They meet him over there. And there's like 5,000 people plus women and children. So we're talking about 20,000 plus people. And so he preaches and he's ministering to them. He's healing them. And anybody who's, who's uh, preached and anybody who's been involved in that kind of ministry knows that there's an incredible uh, drain that's attached to that. 
And, and then Jesus feeds those 20,000 people, and the disciples are exhausted, and he's exhausted, and so he goes up on the mountaintop to pray. And then that night, he sends the disciples out in a boat, and they get out a little ways, and a storm hits, and they feel like they're, they, 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 they think they're going to die. Remember that? And Jesus comes walking to them on the water. Remember that? And, and, and that's a great story where Peter says, hey, if it's you, Lord, have me get out, walk on the water too, and come to you. And he does that. And man, for Peter, there must have been a great adrenaline rush attached to that, right? And uh, when, when they get done with that, Jesus takes them away up to a city called Tyre. And he takes them, that's out of the region of Israel. He takes them out of the region of Israel. Why? Because he wants the anonymity of being in a place to rest that that anonymity will give him. Later in chapter 15, he feeds the 4,000 plus women and children. So upwards of 15,000 people at that particular event comes at the tail end of three days of ministry. The people have been with him three days. They're going straight. They haven't even eaten. No one's eaten. None of them have eaten in three days. And so for three days, he's been teaching hard, working hard, and ministering to them. And now he feeds them. And as soon as he does, he takes the disciples out of the region again. This time, uh, he, they go up north to a, a place called Caesarea, Caesarea Philippi and a Gentile area where he can get away and just rest. Say all that to say there's, there has to be a place where you have to pull back and pull yourself apart or be pulled apart. We just have to think that way. When, when we have big things happening in our life and we've been on adrenaline for a while, there's got to be that time of rest. Let me, let me talk to you. Would, would you give me permission to, to, to talk a little bit about Jesus' rhythms of rest? Jesus had a rhythm of rest. Let me explain that. He had a daily rhythm of rest, he had a weekly rhythm of rest, and he had a seasonal or yearly uh, rhythm of rest. So his daily rhythm was he would withdraw with the Father, and he would pray, the Heavenly Father, he would pray, and then he would engage with people. He would withdraw with the Father, he would engage with people, and that was his rhythm for the day. He would get in the Father's presence, uh, what do you want me to do with my day? Here's, here's what I want you to do. He would withdraw, engage, withdraw, engage, and that was his daily rhythm of rest. Then there was the weekly rhythm of rest. He would work six days and rest one on the Sabbath. He would re work six days, rest one on the Sabbath, right? And that was the weekly rhythm of rest, and then he would have a seasonal uh, uh, rest where they would have feasts and festivals and kind of like holidays that we have and that they would celebrate Jewish uh, holidays and feasts and things. And, and some of them were a week or more at a time and they wouldn't work and they would take that time to recoup and rest and, and worship the Lord and celebrate what God was doing. And so you have these daily rhythms, withdraw, engage in that order, withdraw first, then engage. There's wisdom in that. Withdraw, engage, withdraw, engage. The weekly rhythm, work six, keep the Sabbath, right? And then the seasonal. And so when, when you have a vacation time, when, when there's natural holidays, which is coming up here in December, or maybe you get another extra week for the New Year's or whatever it is, hey, take advantage of that. Get some rest, recoup, and, um, and, and just try to get in the presence of God. Celebrate what God did this year. Get excited about what he's going to do in your life next year, and that will help you. But we got to have rest. Okay, number two. Got to keep moving here. Time, time in God's presence, just being with the Lord. Hey, now what happens when we've crashed from living on adrenaline, depending on how, how high it's been, because you can have uh, uh, mini rushes and mini crashes, and you can have very large adrenaline rushes and very large crashes. So depending on how high it's been and what kind of situation you've gone through or how long you've been through it, you know, if it's been like a major life-changing time and we're coming through that, what happens is God can feel very distant. When you crash, God can feel very, very distant. I mean, we saw that even with the prophet Elijah. Even Elijah felt that. God, where did you go? What did I do wrong? Where are you? Why have you abandoned me? Right? I mean, he just called fire down from heaven. All, all those different things that happened. And even before that, Elijah's life, God, he knew God was with him. But at that moment, he's like, God, where did you go? And he's on that crash. And Elijah was like, I'm the only one left. And he's telling God, nobody cares about me. And, and so, you know, you get in your prayer time with the Lord and it feels like you're in a room by yourself and you're talking to the four walls and it feels like God's not even listening to you. How many of you know what I'm talking about? 
right? And you don't feel very close to God, and you don't have any energy to your prayer life, and you don't have any, you don't have a lot of life to your prayer life, and you almost feel like, what's the use? And, and you try, but it's, um, you know what? That is a human response to coming down off of living on adrenaline, right? God hasn't changed. He loves you. He's listening. He's there. He knows. And you know what? God understands, right? I know those times where I don't feel like my prayers are, are getting past the ceiling. You know what? They don't have to get past the ceiling because the Spirit dwells within me. He's there with me. But, and I need to be reminded of that in those times of crashing when my emotions and everything else is screaming to me, God, where are you? He, he's not abandoned you. He's not left you. He loves you. He's, he's there. He hasn't, he hasn't changed. God understands. Isn't it wonderful to know that he knows that we are made, the Bible says, from the dust of the ground. He knows the feebleness of our frame. He knows our limits, right? He knows how we're wired, and he understands and the devil wants to come to you at that low time and begin to beat you up and to begin to make you almost resent God. You know, that here you are and you've done all these things and, and you've gone through all these things and dealt with all those things and you've loved God all these years and, and all of a sudden you feel, where is God? And the devil says, boy, that's right, where is he? And you know what we need to do? We just need to relax. Get in God's presence because if you love God, the feelings, all of that will come. They will come. Don't worry about that. Now, I'm not saying ignore God and forget about God. I'm just saying don't get stressed out if in your prayer time you're not feeling the presence of the Lord to the degree that you have at other times when you're at that time. You understand? We all, we're all there? When, when, when you're coming down off of those high adrenaline times is not the time to evaluate life. Okay? Either in the physical or in the spiritual, you just relax. And don't worry about it. Read your Bible, do the best you can, but don't start, don't start hyperventilating over what you see as your lack of spiritual connection with God. And that's somewhat, listen, that's somewhat where faith comes in. Right? Sometimes we do things by faith. Most of the time you will not feel goosebumps. Most of the time, that's, that's biblical, right? And, 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 and we do things by faith. And it's in those moments where we really have to do them by faith, right? We really have to walk by faith in those times. We just do those spiritual disciplines. We pray, we read the word, we, we, we get with other believers in the church and, we, and we, we pray for one another and we worship the Lord and we do all these things and, and, and we help people and we're generous and we, we do all our spiritual disciplines because it's the right thing to do. And we, and we just say, God is going to help me through. And we do them by faith. And, and, and I'm going to do the right things. And if I do the right things, uh, then I'll feel the right things in time. If I do the right things, I will feel the right things eventually in time. I mean, that's how it is in almost any important relationship. You will rarely feel your way into acting. If you wait until you feel like reading the Bible, well, you may not read it very much, right? If you wait until you, we can't feel our way into acting. If you, if you, if you wait until you feel like praying, well, you may pray very little. I mean, that's just true, right? If you wait till you feel like uh, coming to church before you come to church, well, we're going to really miss you. <laughs> we love you around here. It's been a few weeks, right? <laughs> if you wait until you feel like praising God, you may not. If you feel like worshiping and getting along with him, you may not. Withdrawing with him, well, you may not. And so, so you ha we have to act our way into feeling. When, when we don't feel like doing things, we do them anyway, and then our feelings follow, Right? We, we, we can't feel our way into acting. We have to act our way into feeling. And it's when I don't feel like it, that's when I should do it because that's when I need it the most and that's when it'll be the most beneficial, right? So, so it, you know, if I don't feel like reading the Bible, that's when I should do it the most because that's when I need it the most and it'll be the most beneficial. 
When I don't feel like praying, that's when I should pray the most because that's when I need it the most and when it'll be the most beneficial. When I don't feel like coming to church, that's when I should do it the most because that's when I need it the most and that's when it'll be the most beneficial. When I don't feel like praising and worshiping the Lord, that's when I should do it the most because that's when I need it the most and that's when it'll be the most beneficial. When I don't feel like giving and being generous, that's when I should do it the most because that's when, it, that's when I need it the most and it'll be the most beneficial. When I don't feel like forgiving, that's when I should do it the most because that's when I need it the most and that's when it'll be the most, uh, right? Are, are you, are you uh, picking up what I'm putting down, right? Old 70s phrase there. And when we do what's right, we'll eventually feel what's right. And not the other way around. If we do the right things, we're going to feel the right things. You will feel God's presence again. You're just on a physical and an emotional crash. Okay? So, you know, and maybe it's been a while for you. Maybe it's been a while since you felt God's presence. But you will feel his presence again. God's word gives us that reassurance. But in those times, we do the right things by faith. And God uses that in our walk with him. Amen? All right, we got to keep moving. Number three, get a right perspective. Get a right perspective, and yes, it's purposely written right, W-R-I-T-E. Get a right perspective, okay? Because sometimes what we have to do is we have to get a hold of ourselves, and we have to get a hold of our emotions and our feelings because we live in a society that may be unlike any other in the history of mankind is feelings oriented. If I feel it, then that's the way that it is. Well, maybe, maybe not, right? You can't be true to your feelings because your feelings are all over the place. Feelings are fickle. Feelings are up. Feelings are down. Feelings are over here. Feelings are over here. Feelings change. Feelings are just all over the place. I mean, you can feel one thing one second and another thing, and you're just all over the place. I feel like this one day and feel like this the next day. Feelings are all over the place, and if you, if you run by your feelings, you're going to be all over the place, right? If you're following your feelings, and so uh, you, you can't be true to your feelings. You have to be true to your convictions, which are based on the Word of God. And sometimes that means we have to get a hold of ourselves. Our feelings start going all over the place, and you have to round them and say, no, 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 come back in here. Hold on. You're not going to run me, right? And so we can't live by how we feel. We have, to, we have to live according to the way that things really are. So what we do is you, you get a piece of paper, right? And, and my wife is way better at this than I am. But you get a piece of paper, and you write down what you know to be true, right? No matter what you're feeling, you get a piece of paper, you write down what you know to be true, and just seeing it on a piece of paper helps to navigate appropriately through that season of life. So you write it down how things really are. You know, God has helped me here, or God has helped me in this. You know, God gave me this scripture, and I'm holding on to it, right? Maybe God gave you a verse. You write that verse down. You're like, I know this is true for me in this season of my life, and I'm going to hold on to that, right? And so, like, from my perspective, I'll give you an example. Like, here's something that I, I do, right? Uh, the, the situation could be like, I write down, and when I'm having a crash, I write down, what a great church with people filled filled with people who love God, right? What a, what a miraculous work God is doing. What wonderful people God has given me to work with. And I just write down a list, right? And I start writing down a list because no matter what's happening, there's always something to thank him for, right? God, I thank you that I'm saved. That's real, right? No matter what I feel, God, you saved me. Thank you for my salvation, that I'm gonna go to heaven, right? The best is yet to come, because if that's all that's ahead of me, that's definitely the best is yet to come, right? Even if the rest of my life is hard, I know the best is coming, right? And I write down, I'm saved. God, you saved me, right? I'm going to go to, I'm go to heaven, right? And so, uh, listen, uh, you know, I, I've said this before, maybe a long time ago, maybe it's a good place to put it here again, but, you know, for the believer, earth is as much hell as will ever experience, and then it's heaven forever and ever. For the unbeliever, earth is as much of heaven as they'll ever experience. That's sad. And then it's hell forever and ever. You know, for the believer, this life is as bad as it gets. And it's going to be awesome. 
But for the unbelievers, this is as good as it gets. And then it's hell. Then it is worse. Forever. Unending. Both sides. And, and so I, I write down what's real. God, you saved me. Right? And, 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 and thank you for that. I write down, God is committed to me. God placed in my heart the Holy Spirit. God, God loves me with a perfect love. God, you, you, you don't just love me a lot. You love me with a perfect love. You, you cannot love me any more than you love me because you're God. And you cannot love me any less than you love me or you wouldn't be God. So God, you always love me with a perfect love. I write that down, right? Uh, and, and I have direct access to, 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 to God to ask for what I need. I have direct access to, to God to ask for what I need. Uh, 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 I belong to him. God has a purpose for my life, and I know that he's going to help me, and I know, uh, and he knows what I'm going through. I can know him. He has covered me with his righteousness. He delights in me. Nothing is impossible for him. So I just begin to write a, a list. I begin to get a right perspective and write down things that I know to be true, and the next thing you know, pretty soon, you're feel, you know, you're feeling down, pretty soon you go back through that, you look at that, and you're like, wow, I am really blessed, right? And that helps with recovery, because you got a hold of yourself rather than just feeling crummy at the time and letting your feelings take you who knows where. You know, sometimes if we act off how we feel, then we're going to act horribly because we're feeling horribly, but we have to get a hold of ourselves, and that's a way to help us negotiate that. Look at this. So here's Elijah, and he says, I'm the only one left. Remember? He goes, I'm the only one left of all God's prophets. And God says to him, Elijah, there's 7,000. There's 7,000. And, 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 and what's cool is this is written down. This is written down. God, this is written. And so, so uh, he says, verse 18, yet I reserve, this is God talking to Elijah, yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal and whose mouths have not kissed that stupid statue. It's not just you, Elijah. You're not the only one left. There's 7,000. You know, if Elijah could have sat there in that cave or under that tree and started writing down some of the names that he knew of people who were faithful to God, and you know he had to have known some of those 7,000 other people as the prophet of Israel, and, and, and if he would have started writing some of those things down, it would have really helped him out a lot. And one of the things that God is doing here by saying this is God is helping him and reminding him of how things really are. God's giving Elijah a right perspective. This is how things, you feel this, you feel this. God says, here is how things really are. There's 7,000 Elijah. You're not alone. I love you. I'm with you. I'm speaking to you. And there's 7,000 others, and you know that, Elijah, right? And that's good. Okay, we got to keep going. Number uh, four, we won't take as long on the next few. Uh, apologize. Uh, number four, think long term. Think long-term, verse 15 and 16. Okay, in other words, think about where you're going. There's something about knowing where you're going, right? Do you know what God uh, did? In that cave, God came to Elijah and said to Elijah, what are, you, what are you doing here? And I wish I knew which word God was emphasizing there, or if he emphasized any of the words. What are you doing here, Elijah? Because it could really dramatically change what it's meaning. What are you doing here? 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 Right? So I, I don't know. I, I don't know where the emphasis are, but what are you doing here? And uh, Elijah gave him his sob story again. And God basically says, okay, here's the plan. Here's what we're going to do. I want you to go, and I want you to go find a guy by the name of Elisha, and I want you to anoint him. He's going to be your successor. He's going to be your right-hand man for a little while. Okay? And then he's eventually going to be your successor, but he's going to be with you, and he's going to help you, and you're going to help train him, and all these things, and then you're going to go anoint somebody uh, to be king over Syria, and then you're going to anoint somebody else to be king over Israel, and I've got things for you to do, Elijah. I, I got more things for you to do, and, and so here's the plan, and here's where I want you to go, and what I want you to do, and you, Elijah, have to begin thinking beyond where you're at. And so when we get this perspective of long-term we begin, to, we begin moving forward, okay? Number five, you have to have friends. 
You have to have friends. Elisha did the one thing that you cannot do when you're struggling with depression or recovering from an adrenaline rush, crash. You, you, you cannot isolate yourself. And that's the temptation, right? Because you don't have any energy. I don't have energy for other people. I just have enough for myself and I feel bad for myself and all my energy is going into that. And, and, but you have to have a friend. Now, if you say, well, I wish I had a friend. I don't really have friends. I wish I had one. Well, wonderful. Uh, you're ready for, to hear some good counsel, right? If you need a friend, be a friend, right? And, and, and what did God do with Elijah? He said, I want you to go to Elisha. God didn't say, sit here and I'm going to bring you friends, right? Because that's not the way that it works. Maybe you figured that out already. But you have to get out and you have to try to make friends. And what you sow, you're going to reap. If you sow friendship, you will reap friendship, right? The book of Proverbs says a man that has friends must show himself what? Friendly. Listen, when you're in the hospital, let's say you go to the hospital. God forbid you go to the hospital. I wish you never would. If you go to the hospital and you're there for a few days and you want friends to visit you, that's not the time to make friends, to come visit you, right? You should probably already have those, right? And, and, and so, uh, um, so if you're here and you're not crashed and you're on that adrenaline, be proactive. Start to make friends because we, we none, no person can live up here all the time, right? And so there's going to be times where you just have to have friends, and now is the time to make them. If you are on that crash and you don't have friends, okay, well, this one might be a little harder to go through. Now you kind of can help work towards the next one to make it easier. Uh, but you are here at a very, very friendly church, and we're going to try to help you. And this is an easy place to make friends, and we try to facilitate the best we can. In 2024, we're putting some things into action to help facilitate that even more. Uh, but this is a very friendly church, and I know there's people in here that are looking for friendships, and so maybe after service, you need a friend, everybody meet over here to the left, and, uh, and uh, let's make it happen, right? No awkwardness. We all know why we're here, right? Introduce, exchange names, right? Exchange names, you know? Where are you from? How long have you been around here? How long have you been at the church, right? Just begin to some opening questions, try to find some common ground. That's what I do. I, I try to facilitate friendships um, with people. You know, when I meet new people, you know, I'll say, oh, where are you from? And they'll be like, oh, I just moved here from Ohio. And I'm thinking, oh, Ohio, I, 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 I know somebody else in the congregation who's uh, from Ohio. Wait right here. I go get them. Hey, you're from Ohio? They're from Ohio, right? They're like, are you really? What part? And they start talking about Ohio and blah, blah. And I back away and a job well done, friendship made. I try to do that. Hey, we got to do that for one another, right? Right? Let's help each other out. Let's make some friends. We've got to have friends. And so it's not good for people to be alone. The best you can, try not to isolate yourself. Okay, number six. Got to keep moving. You understand. Number six, delegate. <laughs> delegate. You know, here the Lord gives Elijah this plan for delegating. I want you to delegate. I'm gonna. Uh, I'm gonna. I want you to delegate some things to Elisha. You can't just do everything by yourself, Elijah. That's why you're thinking me, me, me. I, I, I'm the only one left. It's because you're the one doing it all. So, so uh, here's Elijah, and you're gonna have to delegate some things to Elisha. There's some people, you know, especially if you're a Type A person. Uh, you figure, you know, it's just quicker for me to do it myself than it is to teach somebody else how to do it. You know what we're talking about, right? You're, you are what's called a classic overfunctioner, right? I, I lean towards this, classic overfunctioner. It means you do things for others. You, you do things that others can and should be doing for themselves. I'll just do it. I'll just grab it. Right? I'll just wipe it up. You know, I'll, just, I'll, I'll, I'll do it, right? I got it. I got it. I got it. Right? Doing things for others, what they should be doing and can do for themselves. Classic overfunctioning. And so if that's you, well, you know what? That's going to limit your life and wear you out. That's not going to help you in that. So you're going to have to learn to delegate some things and to release some, some, some things to others. Um, and so number seven, uh, this is one that everyone's going to love. I know it. Everyone's going to love this one. Number seven, exercise. Oh, yeah. Right? Everybody's like, oh, right. Let me preface it with light exercise, right? I'm not, I'm not ready to jump all the way there yet. Because the one, you know, this one, I don't like this one. Uh, to be honest, I don't like this one. I, I don't like to exercise. Uh, but it's helpful, you know? So, uh, you know, I got to work on some of these things too. So I don't like to exercise. You know, whenever I have some spare energy and some spare time, I don't like to lift heavy things up over metal over my head. I don't like to do that, right? I've never 
really felt the need to one day be able to pick up a car. I, I just <laughs> don't have that desire. I don't even think I have that frame. But um, you know what? If, if you don't like to exercise, maybe you can just start with one sit-up a day. Half a sit-up when you get up in the morning, half a sit-up when you go back to bed at night, right? Start there. Start there. Start somewhere, right? Maybe on Sundays you take the furthest spot in the parking lot, right? Right? And, and, and you know, everybody's be like, wow, look at them. They're, you know, they're giving the front, the good spots to new, new guests, right? And you're like, nah, just get a little exercise, right? And when you're at work, take the stairs. You know, whatever it is, you know, uh, find some ways to do some light exercise that can help you. One, one of the best things, you know, for a sore muscle, like if your arm is sore, one of, the, one of the best things you can do is just some light exercise. It just works out that lactic acid, right? And, and, and nothing extreme, but light exercise can help the body uh, recoup. Uh, faster. So, and then finally, number eight, uh, take control of your emotions. Take control of your emotions. We talked about this a little bit, but I want to want to talk about it a little bit more and make it its, its own point. You have to get a hold of yourself. You cannot let your feelings run you. You ha- and you have to decide this. You have to decide it before you're in the moment of the feelings are super intense. Right? It's, it's hard to make decisions when your feelings are super... You have to, when you're in a, you know, a, a spot of sanity, to make decisions. When, when I know I'm going to get angry or I'm going to get sad or I'm going to feel depression, you know it's coming, you pre-make the decisions. I'm not going to let that run me. So maybe even now, as you're here in the presence of the Lord, you can start making good decisions and saying, hey, when I hit super highs or super lows, I'm not going to let that run my life. And you have to, I'm going to get a hold of myself. David says this in Psalm 103, verse 1. He says, praise the Lord, O my soul. But, but let me read it how he's writing it, okay? It's not just praise the Lord, O my soul, right? And all those within me praise his holy name, right? You know what David is doing right here? He's talking to himself. If you go back to the story of what's happening why he writes this psalm. He's, he's in danger. He's, he's feeling low. Uh, he, and, and he's talking to himself, and he's talking to his own soul. He's saying, praise the Lord, O oh my soul. He's talking to his soul. Soul, praise the Lord. Right? Oh, oh, praise the Lord, O oh my soul. He's saying, soul, get a hold of yourself. Soul, you need to praise God right now. You need to praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, oh my soul, right? Apparently, he, he, he doesn't feel like praising God because he's telling his soul, hey, soul, start praising God, right? He's doing what we illustrated. He's acting his way into feeling. He's doing what is right by faith. The feelings will follow, but he's saying, no, I don't feel like praising the Lord, but soul, we're gonna do this. Soul, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, oh my soul, right? And all that is within me, praise his holy name. He's talking to himself and and every part of me, all my inmost being. Verse two, bless the Lord, oh my soul, right? Soul, you're going to do this. You don't feel like doing it, but you're not going to run me. We're going to do this, soul. We're going to bless the Lord. He just said it in verse one. He says it in verse two. Why? Because sometimes we got to tell ourselves more than once right? And forget not all his benefits. And the rest of the chapter is he gets a right perspective. He just writes out all of God's benefits that he can think of at the time that the Spirit of God is giving him, right? The the Spirit of God is inspiring him to write. He writes that all out. David says in Psalm 42, verse 5, another interesting passage, why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so discouraged? Soul, you're discouraged. David is feeling discouraged. David's feeling depressed. And so he starts talking to his soul. Soul, here's what we're going to do. Soul, put your hope in God. Do what's right. Act your way into feeling. Get a hold of yourself. David is getting a hold of himself. Put your hope in God, soul, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. This is David, and he's getting a hold of himself. This is a time when he doesn't feel like doing it. And, and you know what? This will do more for us if we get a hold of our emotions. Amen? Amen. You know, here's the thing we have to remember is, is that in Elijah's case, the greatest days were still ahead of him. His greatest days were still ahead of him. I mean, he's, he's going to get a, a chariot ride to heaven. I mean, that's pretty awesome, right? 
He, he's going he's gonna to throw his cloak down, and the Jordan River is going to part in half so he can walk on dry ground. I mean, he's got amazing things coming yet. I mean, he had some pretty cool things in front of him, but he didn't know that. But you know what? If you love God, Psalm 37, 23, the Lord directs the steps of the godly. He delights in every detail of their life, that God delights even in the tiniest details of our life. He delights in that. Now, the scripture says if you love God, you know, no matter how discouraged you might be, your best days are ahead. Your best days are ahead. Now, I believe the best is yet to come. I believe that. I am so firm that the best is yet to come in this church. I believe the best is yet to come in my life, right? Because listen, if the best has already happened, that'd be a terrible thought, wouldn't it? But the best is yet to come if we're walking close to God. If we're walking with the Lord, we're going to get closer and closer and closer to God, and we're going to experience new things in God, and we're going to go from glory to glory to glory in God, right? God's got good things in store for you and for this church, and, and we want to be ready for them, and we want to see them, yes? So we got to be able to get a hold of ourselves and understand kind of the ebb and flow of life. And there's going to be times where we're worn out and we're tired. And when our body is equalizing and living off of that adrenaline and from a difficulty or a busy season can bring. So hang in there. You'll equalize. And God loves you. And he's with you. And he's going to be with you. Amen.